As we talked about coming here this, this week and what topic I would cover that wouldn't put everyone to sleep but would actually be helpful, we thought about, well, why don't we tell them how to run their operations? Like, yeah, not. How about a demo? It's like, well, I can't do either, so I decided to pick something else that I'm most familiar with. And that's something we have done for the last 20 some odd years is really think about innovation. And it's interesting, when I hear Kevin last night talk about disruption, kind of got me going, really? A music songwriter's talking about disruption? There's clearly some things going on. So I think that the title suits. Just for those of you in the room, anybody not worried about disruption through innovation in the room? Well, that's too bad. Because there's actually something here to help you, too. Um, so we'll get through it. I think the, um, the concept for getting through this, or, or the why, is we, I go back a number of years, and there is, um, there is a, an individual that is kind of the Yoda of technology. And so although this is a bit technology focused, uh, really trying to be helpful, and I think there are some things here that you can really apply to enterprises in general. This isn't technology. It certainly helps with, with technology. But it is something you can think about as you think about how to embrace innovation and how to make that real in your business as we think about how to disrupt in this marketplace in a variety of ways. Uh, the author I'm talking about in the, the book I'll refer to is something called Zone to Win. Uh, Jeffrey Moore, if you've been in Silicon Valley or in part of a startup, or the other thing I'd ask you to think about is you may be in a position to help technology companies or embrace them or think about them from a, in your leadership and operations. And this will give you a sense of how to, how to think about them as well in terms of how they innovate. Um, those books would be helpful. One was Crossing the Chasm. It was, just, it was critical for us as we, as we look back on it. We didn't get to it right away. It played out perfectly in how our business grew over the years. And there was another one he came up with which was called Inside the Tornado, and that's operating principle, principles around how to think about your business when you get to that stage especially if you're a technology company. So I would ask if you're, if you're getting involved or thinking about working with technology partners, those are things that will help you understand them. There's another book called Transaction Gap. I'm not going to go into any of those, but just know those are really, really important things to think about if you're dealing with technology. This really was, was something that we were struggling with at our size business um, to a mature model, and a lot of you are running kind of a mature state, and it's really about how do you run a mature business and think about innovation. And so I'll get into that. The book that I'm talking about here is Zone to Win. We, um, we had an opportunity, one of our staff members used it at a prior organization. This has not been around for 20 years. This is largely, I think, in the last three years or so. We're effectively an early adopter here, so we're the guinea pig running through it, and I hope it works out well. If not, I'll come back and tell you another time how poorly it worked out, or I may not be back. Um, but that said, it, gives, it, it really focuses on the three horizons. And I really, I'll talk about them for a little bit because I think it's really important to understand in what leads to what I would call the crisis of prioritization, which you will invariably feel if you try to run your core business and innovate. It happened to us, and I'll give you a couple of, of examples of that. Horizon One's easy. Uh, that's really how, that's your core business. That's running your, your current environment. Uh, Horizon 3 is also actually pretty easy, and that's really making, it's kind of R&D. It's easy, you're going to cap that investment, you're going to try some new things, right? You're going to pilot it, see if it's going to work. And where it really gets challenging is getting into that Horizon 2. And Horizon 2 is where you take those concepts and ideas and you try to drive them into maturity, and you think about them, um, you, th you, you try to get your best people on it, you try to, to drive it into profitability, but the reality is, I think about in our business, if we want to start a new product and it's not really driving revenue and we're trying to get market adoption, our best people, our best salespeople want to work on products where they're getting commission, right? Well, if I'm paying commission and I'm not getting any revenue, nobody wants to move there. So let me take another example. There are 56 companies in his book that talks about companies we all know about that were the best of the best that all failed to catch that next wave. And it's because they failed to understand what Horizon 2 meant, how to embrace it, and how to drive it into their business. So I'm defining the problem here, and I'll talk about how to approach that from a business perspective. The one great example that you all know, uh, and I'll talk about another one that we sadly all know, but um, the first one is Kodak, right? Great company, really good company, focused on cameras doing awesome things. And when you get into the book and you read about that story, Jeffrey Merrill will do a much better job talking about it but they had in R&D all of the capability to be a great digital company. Guess what happened? Everybody on the left side, everyone on the Horizon One was driving to you know, revenues and profitability and that was the economic engine of the business, so go there and it's like, well, we should put some time into digital. Yeah, whatever, what are you guys, like a million dollar business? Who cares? Nobody did. Guess what happened? They failed 
to understand that was their future, to invest in it, to drive it, and recognize that it's okay to take down on Horizon 1, to invest in Horizon 2, to get the ultimate benefit. That's your transformation. That's how you transform to a great company, recognizing and embracing that. They didn't. Another example, really good one, as a Canadian, it's kind of funny, Blackberry, right? And there's 56 more you will, most of you will know. And so it's that ability to understand what is the framework I can apply as an innovator to make sure I run my core business but understand how to disrupt. And so I'll get into that now. And I'll talk about how we did it. So first of all, if, if it, it really breaks down your business into four zones. Uh, the one on the, I'm trying to think top left, uh, you're right, performance zone. Okay, that's, where, that, that's largely where you're going to find the folks that are making the number. Those folks are generally you're going to find uh, go-to-market teams, your sales folks, potentially marketing, your uh, delivery organization, if that's, that's for us, but largely the folks making the number. The ones that the productivity zone is largely legal, finance, um, HR, shared service, if you will. Right? And so you think about that productivity zone, and I'll talk about how to think about it in a minute, but it's largely the top, top left is sustaining innovations and revenue performance. That's what they think about. Um, on, the bottom, on the horizon three is you have incubation zone. Okay? An incubation zone is where you have kind of that R&D spend and you're doing some unique and interesting things. And then on the, on the transformation zone, that's something I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. It's largely, uh, actually I'll talk about it. It's when, when you find something in incubation that is so meaningful that's going to be, and he has a principle for say it needs to be at least 10% of your revenue, that's when you might move something into transformation zone. Um, an example of that might be, well, Kodak had the incubation zone. They had that digital camera technology going. They failed to make it their number one priority as a business. If you know Salesforce, what did Salesforce do? They made Health Cloud their number one priority for their business. Yeah, they're a CRM company, they're doing great things, but they're talking about the next wave. That next wave, and we hear Bezos talk, he talks about, everything he talks about now is health cloud transformation, how he's gonna play a role in that. And so they've moved it there, they're actually taking down some of the performance numbers to make sure they invest heavily and deliver on what they think is that next wave and catch it. And those waves, by the way, come literally, you know, if you catch one once every 20 years, you're gonna be a great business. Apple caught three in 10 years. Right? And that was the discipline they had to go after the different technologies that they, they moved with. Generally what happens is there's a net new spend. When you have a major transformation, it's a secular movement in a, a net new investment and you want to chase that because that's where the revenue growth is. Material revenue growth happens there and that lasts for about five to seven years. And again, these principles are explained. Um, when I think about you know, what um, for us, we've actually zoned our business so that we have the kind of characteristics in each zone matter. If you have people that are competitive, they care about numbers, they want to deliver, they think red, green, yellow, your operations, those folks tend to be in the performance zone. The ones in the productivity zone, if you talk legal or finance or so on, they tend to be professionals. They think about their profession first and think about delivering to the business as a service, if you will, and you want to leverage them as a shared service environment. You have to have the right mindset there. On the incubation zone, those are ten, tend to be entrepreneurs, right? So don't take somebody who's like fighting for revenue and then say, hey, by the way, why don't you go and work on the startup thing? These people hate structure, right? They're all generalists, they run fast, they need, kind of, they need to be in isolation, you need to give them that opportunity, but if you try to run it like a mature business, you're gonna fail every time. We had this problem, and I'll be open about it. Um, we bought a home care company, and what do we do? We went, oh, great. Let's start measuring revenue. Let's start measuring growth. Let's throw it in the marketplace and run fast and put some on that really wasn't an entrepreneur, so to speak. And what happened? We failed. Why did we fail? The entire team was designer on the metrics that didn't matter. What mattered in the early stage was market product fit. Let's get it right first and let's grow later. And this is as you think about your business and the things you can do in incubation, it's about getting it right and scaling it later. And then it can move up into the performance zone or you can transform your business around it depending on how material it is. So the characteristics of the people in each of those zones actually matter and correlate to your success. So be careful who you put there because a rock star in the performance zone may not be great in the incubation zone or they're in the productivity zone. We've zoned our business and assigned our leaders. So I actually run the performance zone our CFO runs the productivity zone, and we have a venture board, which is actually very interesting, that runs the incubation zone. And we run it like a VC. And the reason we run it like a VC is because it matters. You know it's the right thing, but the discipline around moving through and thinking about funding it, if you're funding it yourselves, it's even harder. 
you use a VC, it's always easy, right? You're always moving to that next milestone. If you fund it yourself in incubation, it's very hard to make sure you get to those next milestones, hold yourselves accountable, and figure out what's that next amount of funding we're going to give it to kind of move it through the J curve, which is we're going to lose money for a while and we're going to come out of it. Right? There's a fundamental theory that's really important. And the other thing that's really important there, if you do have investors and boards, talking about what's in incubation, educating around the vernacular of what that means, and having a common mindset to move through it is really important. Because a lot of times you talk a different language there, and it's the easiest thing to kill in a business if you want to maximize profits. And that's your future. So be careful of that. What else do I want to talk about there? So for us, we, we zoned our business. We assigned the right people to lead them. Um, one of the other things we did that was interesting is we, we talked about the interconnectivity between them. What was very interesting is we were somewhat of a siloed organization before. And although it feels like we pulled the business apart, we actually brought it together. Because what happened was the performance, all the zones worked well together and they planned together. But then they started to talk about what do we need to do to support each other? So what do I need from, I'll talk about our, our delivery team. What do I need to make sure that we, we deliver on the success metrics we need with, with our customers? And who's going to pay for that? And so it was a way to talk about an SLA between the zones is how you might think about it. So it all of a sudden created some accountability between them. And for the most part, it was a conversation that mattered. It wasn't that you had a con it was that you had the conversation. And it really minimized the conflict we had. And it allowed us to deal with the crisis of prioritization, which is really what that book's around. What I was going to say, we actually run monthly meetings to talk about each of these zones to hold ourselves accountable to an outcome. Um, those are going well, and we're finding them. Again, we're eight months in. We started this about a year ago, understood the concept, and liked it so much we ran fast into it. We're an early adopter. There's not many other organizations that have done that. I would say the ones that I'm aware of, you know, sub 20. Um, so it is a relatively new concept, but it's catching fire fairly quickly. And uh, with any luck, that light at the end of the tunnel is not a train. So we're excited about it. Uh, the other thing is change management, painful. You all know this. Uh, it's not unique to our business or yours. Uh, change management is hard. And I think what uh, we struggle with a bit is we ran fast and forgot to really talk about the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we changing the business? What is the purpose behind it so everyone can get on board? We ran pretty quick, and it was tough to, to drag everyone along. We're getting there, but uh, communication, as you all know, is, is critical to change. So let me take this now to um, senior living. And so when you think about this, and, and I'll talk about a disruptor, and ultimately there's, there's two ways to think about that transformation zone. You can get there and play the offensive. You can be the aggressor. You can do things that are unique and different and drive the market to be different. Or you can play defensive, which stay in the performance zone. But when you see it happen, you need to react. You need to neutralize that threat and get back to standard operating norms or make the changes that are necessary. You don't have to lead. You don't have to. Some are very good at following. Microsoft, great at following. Really, really good company. Kind of went through a lull there, but they followed. They weren't the first to cloud technology, but they're going to do as well or better than most. And so when I think about senior living, this market is being disrupted today. Not you specifically, unless you run an agency, but there is a platform that's disintermediating agencies. right? And so I'm not doing it, but there are platforms that are doing it. And they're creating a connection that is different. If you're in the agency business today, you're getting disrupted. Somebody's coming with the platform, connecting with the end caregivers, the end staff, and disintermediating the agencies and connecting them directly with you. And they're doing it at a different price point across the board. And there are, we've talked to, I think, in the neighborhood of 10 companies, all reasonably small, generally geography-based, but starting to grow, starting to connect, trying to create these networks and doing really well in changing the game. And so if you think you're going to continue with that traditional pattern of agency, you will not have a business in five years. I know that because I used my magic eight ball and it told me. I have no idea. But it is getting disrupted, and they need to have a defensive strategy. Some of the other things I might talk about are if you look at senior living in general, your performance zone is doing what you currently do. Serve your current, your current residents and do it well. Your productivity, think about this as you always have an opportunity to try something unique. Um, and generally there, you want to get better, faster, cheaper. right? You want to create more efficiencies in your business. You want to be more effective. And that is, you know, for us, that would be we're going to exchange this old, awful system we have in CRM and put in Salesforce, as an example. It'll improve our business and our efficiency as a whole. Those are the kind of things you might do there. But ultimately, over time, you just want to get better. Um, programs and systems you'll talk about, really important concept. In incubation, these are some of the things we hear from you today. These aren't our ideas, but what we've heard play back. So whether that's uh, concierge home services that's starting to impact or affect your business, 
Or one of the things, and you know, I don't know if Lynn's here yet, but as she talked about Connect for Life, um, I looked at that as her kind of incubation project. And she had to prove it out and demonstrate outcomes and indicate what the value would be to have the world kind of go, huh, there's something really there. How are we going to move that to transformation, right? And is that the perennial consortium? consortium? Or what is that that's going to that's gonna move it to transformation? But that is going to change her business model forever, right? And those that happen to come along with her. And so how is that going to impact you if you happen to be one of those market areas or you're evaluating it? Do you, do you find a way to join her? Do you, do you find a way to embrace Medicare Advantage? What do you need to do to take advantage of that opportunity in front of you? So those are, um, those are kind of how we see it hitting the senior living space. And again, the applicability between what we do and how we zone our organization to think about how we all work better together, uh, how we take these principles and apply them depending on what stage you're at, and how to not ignore those things in incubation or recognize when they're there. These are easy exercises to do with your team. Everyone has great ideas. Those ideas can easily work their way into incubation. And you're not going to have 100 things there, but you have a handful. And generally, you need to find a way to say, OK, we're going to kill it. We're going to split it out. We're going to move it into the performance zone, or we're going to make it the most important thing in our organization. That's generally how they end up. And so when you get to transformation, you decide there's one thing you're going to move. It is one thing. It's not 20. It's one. And so to kind of just finish this off and try to get us back on track, I had uh, uh, we do have the Zone to Win book being dropped off in, in your room, so you can have a look at it if you like. It's, uh, it's an interesting, quick read. Um, he's a great author. He actually came out to our organization to kick this whole thing off for us uh, at the end of last year. And uh, it was really good to hear from him in person. He's, a, he's got you know, really, really good ideas, and I think they're applicable to, uh, to all of us. So this is really, end of the day, is really trying to be helpful. Our teams here, Travis, Cheryl, Jason, uh, are all here to help. If you have any questions about this and how we've adopted it, the good, bad, and the ugly, I didn't share all the ugly, but there, believe me, there are some uglies there. I'll be happy to help you avoid them, and uh, we're around. So thank you.